some of the, the corruption is so blatant that it's, um, it's laughable. We had one whistleblower who was a lawyer employed by the bank in the Philippines uh, who reported on the way in which the Philippine National Airlines was privatized. And information sh she had suggested that the airlines was sold to a private syndicate based in Macau, uh, a tobacco syndicate, as, as a matter of fact, for zero money that it was given away. In the course of her own investigation of this case, it emerged that the president of the Philippines had lost the airline in a poker game one night to the owner of this tobacco syndicate. Now, the lawyer was fired. She lost her job. She's still not been reinstated. The World Bank has managed to uh, defend, essentially, the prerogatives of the president to dispose of the airline in any way that he saw fit. Uh, so that's one case. Another case that we've been working on uh, in which we have a whistleblower is the case of the privatization of the, or the attempted privatization of the national oil company in Azerbaijan, also through uh, voucher privatization. And the man who has um, managed this program is a name who may be familiar to you, that is Victor Kojini. Kojini, of course, was the operator here in the Czech Republic who um, established the Harvard Capital Fund, which bought vouchers from citizens, or uh, citizens invested their vouchers with his holding companies. He was then to buy public assets, but he used um, the weak regulatory system to tunnel the capital out of the Czech Republic to tax oases in, uh, in foreign countries into companies over which he had control and his investors had no control. And the estimates are that he got away with about a billion dollars. Um, we have an investor who bought, uh, who bought into his Kojini's company in Azerbaijan, which was cornering the market on vouchers there. These were, um, this was a different kind of operation. Kojini had Chechen militia spread out over Azerbaijan with US dollars that he flew into the country in private planes, in cash, in suitcases, and bought vouchers, accumulated them, and at a given moment, he was going to use those vouchers to buy a controlling interest in the National Oil Company. The problem was the National Oil Company was never to be privatized. And so he decided instead to simply make off with the investments, which he did. Our uh, client is an investor who went to the prosecutors in New York and turned over the evidence of how Cushini's company operated. He himself, Burke, the investor, was indicted and Kojini continues to live in the Bahamas more or less uh, at large. So this leaves another area, I think, of international um, business that needs to be penetrated by whistleblowers, which is this whole area of private banking and moving funds anonymously to unnamed beneficiaries in tax havens offshore, and that is what we're trying to do now. This is going to be extremely dependent on whistleblowers because there's very little public regulation over these, over these capital flows. The only way we're gonna get information is if we have people inside these banks telling us what's going on. Thank you, Beatrice. Uh, so let's open up the debate and discussion just one remark, uh, Kojini case is, some, is quite sensitive here because it's, I think it's a painful part of our modern history and I think the usual perception of Czechs was that uh, they were not very happy what Kojini did here and that he stole the assets, but we were kind of happy that he also managed to cheat the Americans later. <laughs> uh, we were not the only ones stupid enough to jump on his promises, but uh, that's, another, that's another story. But let's open up the discussion. I would, uh, I would come up first with two short questions maybe and to use it at the beginning. One, uh, 
Uh, if you could say at least few words about this uh, false claim act, how it works in the US, and maybe even related to rewards for whistleblowers, maybe Stephen, what you dis we discussed yesterday, because I find it quite relevant for, for this audience. And second thing I would like to ask you, careful, no one, hold down, okay. Uh, uh, just second thing, uh, we have experience with whistleblowers, whistleblowers, although we have not, we don't use this term for them uh, until now. But there are a lot of cases which could be called whistleblowers and they should be. But uh, I wonder whether, in your experience, it is worth to actually uh, study their initial motives at the very beginning for blowing the whistle, because very often the case is that they are not uh, they are not idealists at all. You know, they are not willing to protect public interest at the first hand, mm -hmm. but they they have very selfish motives or whatever others. So, so these two questions you can answer, and then of course the floor is open. Okay, uh, I'd like to just I'll do the False Claims Act. Uh, the most powerful whistleblower law in the United States is known as the False Claims Act. And it has, it actually came from Europe and transplanted into the United States at the time of the U.S. Civil War. But for a variety of reasons was not used until 1986 when the law was fixed. And it has a concept, it's a Latin concept known as qui tam. It's a Latin phrase abbreviated that means in the name of the king. And what it permits a whistleblower to do, or any worker, is to stand in for the government to either push the government to do its job, or if the government doesn't do its job, the whistleblower can go into court and do the job on behalf of the people. It only relates to fraud in public procurement. If someone lies or cheats to get a public contract, they're guilty under this law, and they have to give all the money in the contract back times three. So if you had a million dollar contract and you cheated to get it, you have to give back to the government three million dollars. And the whistleblower gets a reward for undertaking this effort, for risking their career to expose the contract fraud, and then pushing to either force the government to go after this money, or going into court and getting the money on behalf of the taxpayer. So the way it would work, and again, I'll just give you an example, is say somebody paid a bribe and got a contract to build a bridge for $10 million. And someone who works for that contractor had evidence of the bribe. They would take that evidence and confidentially give it to the government, the, a, a specified agency, and say, here it is. A bribe was paid, 10 million bucks, to build this bridge. Prosecute them and get our money back. And in many cases now in the United States, the government does do that. But if they don't, the whistleblower can. So if the evidence holds, that contractor now owes and must pay back $30 million to the taxpayers. They're often then sanctioned. They can go to jail, other penalties. And the whistleblower would get between 15 to 30 percent of the money recovered by the government. The taxpayers always win because it's treble damages, it's three times the amount. But the law sets up a reward to the worker who put their job, career, and name at risk to expose fraud. 